Good morning. Well, a very warm welcome to each one of you here today. Welcome to everyone to Grafscope Church for worship today. If you are a guest here this morning, we are so glad that you're here, glad that God has led you to this place of worship today. Uh, we are excited to be here. We continue now to be in our season of Lent today, the second Sunday of that very special season as together we journey to the cross uh, in a very special way. So it's a, it's a wonderful time to gather together for worship. As we gather for worship, uh, God wants to call us into that worship. I'd like to share with you just a few verses from Psalm 95. The psalmist declares, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is the great God. He is the great King above all gods. So again, this is who we worship today. This is to whom we offer our praise and sing our praises and we're going to do that right now as we begin our worship together. Let's stand and let's sing. We're going to sing to our King. Congregation, our great King, the only true God, greets each one of us this morning with these words, grace, mercy, and peace be to you 
from God our Father, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. 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 Friends, God has extended his greeting to us this morning. I'm going to invite you to turn and wave and say good morning to those around you today as well.
be seated. Would you pray with me just a moment? God, as we gather and worship today, we enter into this time singing our praises to the only true King, our great God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we're reminded as we sang the song just a moment ago of that marvelous vision that you gave the Apostle John. And as he glimpsed into heaven, and he saw and he heard, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Everything is filled with his glory. God, we want this time here to be filled with your glory too. So Lord, we open ourselves up to that today. We pray that you would visit us with your power and with your majesty and with a full recognition of your love and your mercy and the grace that brings us here today. So, Father, we thank you for this time. We ask that you bless it, that we would receive a blessing, but that, Father, you also would be blessed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we go to God together now in a time of confession and commitment, I want to invite you to take out that special insert that you find in your worship bulletins today. And just like last Sunday, there'll be a, a mixing of responsive reading and then singing a few verses of that song, In the Cross of Christ I Glory. The words and music to the song will be on the screen behind me when we get to that point, but the litany will be right here. So just follow along there as we go. So please join me. We look to the cross of Christ and see the women standing at a distance. We hear the crowds heap insults at Christ. We witness people saying, he saved others, but he cannot save himself. We see the inscription over Jesus' head. While it was placed there as a mockery, we hear the crowd saying that Jesus is calling for Elijah. The beams of the cross hold the arms of Christ. The other beam is planted in the ground.
as we look to go to God together in a time of prayer, just a couple of announcements uh, right before that. And the first one is uh, going to come uh, from the group that is uh, putting together what you've heard me talk about the last few weeks, the Refresh and Renew Retreat. So I'm going to invite up Maddie, and she's got an announcement for us. Good morning. So over the past couple of months, I've had the opportunity to be a part of planning this event that we're very excited about. So I just wanted to take a minute and personally invite all of the women in the church, so high school age and up, to an evening that will leave you refreshed and renewed. We will get to spend time together talking, laughing, worshiping with singing, and we also look forward to sharing in the blessing of hearing Anna Weaver that evening. We can't wait to see everybody on March 25 at 7 p.m., and you can sign up in the narthex with a sign-up sheet with a pink bike on it. So we want you to spread the word to invite your moms, sisters, neighbors, and friends. So thanks, and we can't wait to see you in a week, in a few weeks. Thanks, Maddie. And the, the little table for sign-up is on the east side of the narthex. So I know some of you have been looking for it. You've missed it the last week or two, but it's there on the east side, little round table. So now you know uh, where that sign-up is. Then also something that's coming up is uh, our small group ministry as we continue to look to put that ministry together. Uh, last week we watched a short little video, if you remember, and it uh, reminded us that we need each other. And uh, today uh, I want to show you a, a short video also, and it's about co community. And uh, what I want to do is just give you just a little snapshot first of really what this ministry is all about. What, what do you do as you, uh, you know, what is this all about? As we would gather as a small group, maybe eight to ten people, uh, what's the goal of this? And uh, if you've been reading uh, in those Hilltop articles, perhaps you know, but just to set it out in front of all of us, it, it's threefold. Uh, first of all, we're going to be seeking God together, and we're going to do that by way of, of Bible study, looking into His Word. Secondly, we're going to be supporting each other we're going to do that through prayer and encouragement, mutual encouragement. And then also, very importantly, we're going to be serving our community. We want to be the hands and feet of Christ. We want to put into action the kinds of things that we're learning about in our group together. So it's not just something up here, but it's something down here. It's planted on earth. So that's what it's all about. We're going to be seeking God. We're going to be supporting each other. We're going to be serving our community. So if we can have that short video a moment, that would be great. Just watch this together. Yeah, I would say one of the things that helps me feel more confident about why I believe in small groups so much and believe in the idea of being in little communities is that scripture talks about, there's a, there's a particular scripture that says to rejoice when others rejoice and to mourn when others mourn. And for me, to do that alone doesn't even make sense to go through a difficult time that's hard and, and, and challenging and overwhelming, to mourn by yourself is a really sad experience to have. And to have a really great experience like a pay raise or a job promotion or, or to have a new child or to uh, whatever it is, that over the top celebration by yourself isn't really the most exciting thing in the world. And so for me, part of the reason why I think it's powerful for somebody to be connected into a group based upon looking at scripture and studying the Bible one of those is just simply about life and be able to take life by its reins and to know that when you're gonna go through a difficult time, that if you're in a group and you're connected into a, a, a little community, a spiritual community like that, you have more of an opportunity to rejoice in a way that's exciting. You have more of an opportunity when you're going through a difficult time to have care and support and to go through either one of those experiences by yourself. To me, it just doesn't make sense and scripture, I think, lends itself towards that. So again, in a few weeks, we're going to start uh, asking for sign-ups. Just be uh, in prayerful consideration uh, of this ministry. Again, we want it to be a congregationally wide ministry spanning all ages and so forth. Uh, so just keep that on your mind. Keep it on your radar and uh, prayerfully consider that when the opportunity uh, comes up. So a few prayer items uh, for us to remember throughout the week as well. Uh, many of these were sent uh, by way of the email, but just to update them a little bit, uh, Garth uh, Bonsalar has had to spend some time in the hospital. To my knowledge, at least, he continues to be there. So uh, keep praying for him. 
Uh, some good news uh, from uh, Wayne Booby. He has been transferred from Grand Rapids here to Holland. He is at uh, Rest Haven on 40th, uh, where he uh, has got a room right next to Bud Halst, who is there as well. So pray for both of those uh, folks, but uh, for them both, it's really answers to prayer. Uh, if you would keep in mind uh, and in your prayers, Jen Veal, uh, Jen on Tuesday has a significant surgery coming up. It's on her neck, and uh, this is going to be uh, quite a lengthy surgery uh, itself, but the recovery is going to be very lengthy as well. Uh, a couple weeks uh, just flat on her back, then a couple of months uh, in a neck brace, and about another seven months of rehab. So it's a significant surgery. Uh, so if you would please uh, keep Jen and the family uh, in your thoughts and prayers too. And then uh, some folks connected to our congregation. Uh, Tabitha, uh, Russ and Linda Johnson's uh, daughter, is having uh, surgery on Tuesday as well. So pray for her. Uh, for Terry, uh, Harlan and Rosie's uh, son has had some further, uh, further heart issues. He's doing okay now, uh, but we want to keep him in prayer and uh, pray that those issues would subside for him. And then uh, Linda Wiemhoff, uh, Marion Skolton's daughter, uh, who's dealing with cancer, is headed back to, uh, to Mayo this week uh, for further testing and so forth. Uh, so just keep them uh, in your prayers as well. So let's go to God and prayer together. Most merciful God and Heavenly Father, it is with joy in our hearts that we gather here this morning to be able to enter into your presence and truly to sing to you and to be reminded that you and you alone are holy. That you and you alone are the one true God and the only one deserving of all of our praise and all that we can give to you. That you are a God of power and that you are a God of love. That you are a God of majesty and that you are a God of mercy. And then to be reminded in the course of our service already that it was our sin that put Jesus on the cross. For we know we're in the season of Lent, the season in which we are journeying to the cross together, and we're reminded there that Jesus suffered and that he died, not for his sin or any sin that he had committed, for he was perfect in every way, but it was for our sin. That for each one of us can say it was for my sin that Jesus has suffered and died on the cross. And we are so grateful, so grateful, Jesus, for your sacrifice, so grateful, O oh God, for the salvation that you give to us, a salvation full and free in the name and for the sake of Jesus. And so thankful for your gift of the Spirit. Father, we are thankful for this season of Lent. We're thankful for these weeks that we have leading up to, to Good Friday and even to Easter Sunday beyond that to be reminded again of your incredible and amazing grace. We thank you for answered prayer. We thank you for being with Wayne over these past many, many weeks in the hospital there in Grand Rapids, and now being transferred from Grand Rapids to Holland for Rest Haven for, for rehab. Father, that is truly an answer to prayer. Wayne sees that very clearly. His family sees that clearly. Father, they are so thankful, and we are as well. Continue to be with him and with Bud as well as they're there at Rest Haven. And Father, that as they continue the, the recovery and the rehab process, that that would go well for them. Father, we are aware of others in our church family with special needs. We think of Garth, and we pray for him that you would grant healing into his life. We continue to pray for Pastor Bob and all of the concerns with cancer that he's dealing with. Father, we think of many of our members who are in nursing homes or retirement centers, and some of them can make it to worship from week to week. Some of them can't. We, we think of all of them, and we pray for them and ask God that you would give to each one exactly what they stand in need of. We pray for Jen Veal in a special way. In the surgery that she has coming up on Tuesday, Father, we pray that it would go well. Father, we pray that you be with the doctors and that you would guide their hands in the procedure. And, and Lord, already we pray for a, a quick and a full recovery for her. We know that 
Uh, we pray, Lord, that you'll give her patience as, uh, Lord, the road to recovery is, is laid out and it's long. And we just pray, Lord, that you would lay your hand of healing upon her. Be with Tabitha, too, as she has surgery on Tuesday to deal with the cancer that, that she's uh, battling. And Father, for, for Linda and the cancer treatment she's been taking and now going back to Mayo to get some results of that. And we pray, Lord, for, for good news. We continue to pray for Terry and his heart issues. And we're grateful to hear that he's doing well now. And pray that that would continue for him and these issues would be able to put behind him and, and he would go forward in life uh, healthy and strong. Father, for so many other issues and needs and concerns that we have that, that are not generally or widely known and yet they're in our hearts today, even as we sit here in these pews or as we, as we listen to this service, Lord, it's so good to know that, that you know us better than we know ourselves, that even if we struggle to find a, a voice or to find words for what we're dealing with, that, that you know, and that, Father, that you care, and so we offer those up to you as well. Father, we do pray in a special way for those whom so many of us are actively praying for, those whom you've placed in our various spheres of influence who who at this point don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord, as we're challenged to pray for them in a special way throughout this season of Lent, and as opportunities arise to, to extend care to them, and perhaps even the opportunity to share the good news of Jesus. So we pray for each one. Father, we pray for the small group ministry. We ask that as this ministry is being constructed and eventually uh, looking to launch in the fall, we pray, Lord, that your hand would be upon this, and that this would be a wonderful way truly that we can seek you and support each other and, and to serve our community and to do that uh, in the little groups that you give to us. Father, for our nation, we pray today. We've all heard the news of the devastating uh, tornadoes that struck in, in Tennessee and the Nashville area and the destruction that uh, those natural disasters have left in their wake the many lives that have been literally uprooted and many of the lives who have, that have been lost. And so, Father, we pray for those who are reeling from these and we ask that you would touch them in a special way. We're thankful to hear already how these folks are being ministered to and how the community is rallying. And, Father, we pray that even through this, that you would show your power and your grace in their lives particularly. Father, for the world around us too. We know of the great concern with the coronavirus and, and all of the things that are happening and, and even the many lives that have been lost, certainly in China, but in other places too. And we recognize that the shores of our nation have not been untouched. And so, Father, we pray that, uh, that through uh, uh, the work of those uh, in medicine, that they would be able to find something to combat this Father, this, uh, this virus would stop even now. Father, through all of these things, again, we're so glad to be able to come to you in prayer. We are so thankful for the invitation that you give to us and to be able to come to you and know that, that although we feel helpless, uh, that, Father, you are all-powerful. And not only are you all-powerful, but you are all-loving as well that you want to reach out and help us in ways that would ultimately be for our good and certainly for your glory. And we're so very grateful for that. So, Father, again, bless us as we continue in our worship today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And at this time, we have the opportunity to give of our gifts. The offering today is for Growing Hope Globally. And if you're a guest here today, uh, we would just invite you to fill out this uh, green visitor card that you find in the pews there. Uh, put that in the offering plate uh, as it goes by. Or there's a box back in the narthex toward the entry that you can put that in as well. Uh, we would really appreciate that. So at this time, let's worship God together as we give of our gifts.
Well, as we prepare to listen to God's word this morning, let's stand and let's sing together a prayer, really. Open our eyes, Lord. Well, congregation, last Sunday morning as we entered into the season of Lent, we began a, a new series in which we are basically walking with Jesus through a Holy Week. The Holy Week, of course, uh, really spans those eight days between Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. And last week, even though it was the first Sunday of Lent, we actually took a look at Jesus' entry into Jerusalem And we thought about it, and we recognized how just what a a responsible act, just what a triumphant act this really was, uh, that it was really a a dramatic but a yet very meaningful way to Jesus uh, for him to begin this final week of earthly ministry. So this morning, then, we're going to take a look at the Monday of Jesus' final week. And in terms of our scripture reading, we're basically just going to pick up where we left off last time. So once again, we find ourselves in the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 11, uh, verses 12 through 25 is our text for today. You're going to find that on page 1007 of your pew Bibles, uh, if you're following along as I read there. Again, page 1007, Mark 11, verses 12 through 25. So here Mark writes, as carried along by the Holy Spirit, On the following day, which of course would be Monday, when they came from Bethany, he, that is Jesus, was hungry, and seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it, And were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And 
Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. That's as far as we're going to read in God's word this morning, and may he bless his word to us today. Well, congregation, have you ever seen someone do something that seemed just to be completely out of character for them? Have you ever seen someone do something that really made you kind of scratch your head and, and really wonder to yourself, if not just internally, but perhaps even you said it out loud. You said something like, what in the world is going on here? I can remember back a, a number of years ago when I was just a, an elementary school student and, and our family at the time was living in San Diego, California. My dad was pastoring a church there and again that was in my elementary years and, and my dad, he was a lot younger at the time and he got around on a, on a motorcycle, right? It was California so that was a, a good thing to do and a cheap way to travel. Well, it just so happened that there was a, a group of these motorcyclists from our church there, and they decided to go away for a little weekend trip. Now, that was before the time of cell phones and all of this stuff, and I know for some of the kids and young people out there, you can't even imagine that, but it was before cell phones, so we really didn't know what was going on in the trip and didn't know the kinds of things that were happening until my dad got back. And so when my dad got back... He was strangely quiet, didn't say a whole lot. He took my mom off into a separate room where they were talking together. And being the inquisitive little grade school kid I was, I, I peeked in on them and I saw my dad crying. And, and to my knowledge, I, I didn't know my dad ever cried. I, I'd never seen him cry before. And so it really made me wonder what in the world was going on. Then it turns out that tragically there had been an accident on the trip and one of the folks from our church riding a, another motorcycle had been killed. So sometimes people do things that are just completely out of character for them. And sadly the family members and friends of folks that are Alzheimer's patients, they often experience this. Now, many times they sit in stark unbelief as, as their once loving and gentle husband or wife or parent or grandparent just spouts off a, 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 just a list of obscenities that would make even the most seasoned sailor blush. You know, the passage we just read from the Gospel of Mark contains two really of the most puzzling episodes of Jesus' entire life. You know, they're episodes that really catch us by surprise and, and really cause us to wonder what in the world is going on here. Now, one of those episodes, of course, is the, the cleansing of the temple. The other is the cursing of the fig tree. I mean, these stories are rather striking because they both seem to be very much out of character for Jesus. They, they seem, at least on the surface of, of things, to be times when, when Jesus allowed his anger to really get the best of him. Now, obviously, Mark ties these two stories together in our text. They're, they're intimately related. And I think we'll see that more and more as we work our way through both of these episodes this morning. Well, let's start with the cleansing of the temple. You know, the temple in Jerusalem was really a, a fascinating place. And yet it's probably a place that, that you and I really are not overly familiar with. A number of years ago, I guess it's pushing maybe even 10 years ago, Renee and I had the opportunity to, to go to the Holy Land. We got to go to Israel. Uh, we got to go on a little trip there. It, it wasn't with Ray Vanderlaan. I'm, I'm sad to say I would have loved to have done that. This was just with witty travel, just a, a small group of pastors. We went over to Israel. We had a chance to tour around for about eight days. We, we got to be in Galilee, then down to Jerusalem, and kind of everything in between. And, and one of the days that we were there around Jerusalem, 
we had the opportunity uh, to go to, uh, to kind of the old city, right? We, we got the opportunity to go to the Temple Mount itself. I got a picture. Uh, I actually took this picture, but you can see uh, the, the temple itself actually stood where the Muslim Dome of the Rock currently sits. That's the, the golden dome that you see that I'm sure many of you recognize that. Many of you have probably even been there yourself. But, you know, even though the temple obviously isn't there and something else is there now, it was still rather exciting to be on the same grounds where, where this ancient temple actually once stood. Now, by the time of Jesus, uh, the temple had become uh, very much different than what we know today. Now, the temple was destroyed. The temple that Jesus knew was destroyed in AD 70. That's when the Romans sacked Jerusalem. And, of course, it's never been rebuilt. But we have a pretty good idea of what that temple looked like. And this picture here is one from the Jerusalem Museum, and it's just a model of ancient Jerusalem, a model of the time when Jesus would have walked the streets there. And as you can see, just how, how massive the temple area really was, particularly uh, as it's compared to the rest of the city around there. It was just a spectacular structure. I believe I have another photo, the next one, that will bring us even closer to the, the temple area itself, and we can get a sense of, of what this was all about I'm going to throw one more picture on the screen. This one's from a, a book that I have. It gives us a little sense of the scale of what we're talking about here, too, as we see the, the little people and just how big the temple itself was. Now, many of you may already know this, but the, the temple itself was split up into a variety of different courtyards. So, first of all, there's, there's the outer court. Uh, that's the court of the Gentiles. It was to the north and the south of, of the temple proper. So that was the outer court, and this is basically where anyone could gather. It didn't matter what race, what, what gender, what nationality you were. Anyone and everyone could gather there in the outer courts for worship. From there, we had another court, and that's called the court of women. And maybe the next slide will help us out a little bit more with that. So we got the court of women. Now, as we're entering the temple area itself, this is where the Jewish women could go, where they were allowed to go and to worship. The next court was the court of Israel, and this is where the Jewish men could go. And right where it says court of Israel, there's a line through there, and that's a rail. So they could go up to that rail, and they could hand off their, their animals for sacrifice to the priest. So that would lead into the court of priests and the altar of sacrifice where the priests would go, they would take those, those offerings and they would sacrifice them as a burnt offerings to the Lord. Now the final court, per se, was the holy place. That, of course, was in the, the temple proper. And at the west end of that, behind a veil, as most of us know, was the holy of holies. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was kept, right? And only the high priest could enter there. And as we know from what we read in the Old Testament, that was only one time a year when the high priest himself was allowed to enter that area where he would offer sacrifices and prayers for the sins of the entire nation. Now when we catch up to Jesus' time, this, this outer court of the temple, that, that court of Gentiles that you see there, had really become much more of a circus or a, or a zoo than a genuine place of worship for the only true God as it was intended to be. So in the first place, it had become this place where, where sacrificial animals were being sold, and not that that was bad in and of itself, but they were being sold for, for drastically inflated prices because many people who came to the temple didn't live right there in Jerusalem. It was difficult for them. They came from a long ways away, so it was tough for them to bring their own sacrificial animals. But so these animals were being sold there, but for significantly inflated prices. It had also become the place where the temple tax could be collected. That was an annual tax that every Jewish family needed to pay, but they had to pay it in a particular currency. And so that's why the money changers were there. And they were more than happy to exchange currency for upwards of about a 12% surcharge for the transaction. 
Now, this outer court then finally had also become a place where business people, whether they were Jewish or not, business people kind of passed through there with their merchandise. They used it as kind of a, kind of a shortcut through the city. So as you can imagine, all of this activity, all of this hustle and bustle, it was not very conducive to worship. One scholar put it this way, he said, it was basically an oriental bazaar, making it impossible for any Gentile to use the area for prayer or serious devotion to God. You see, that's what made Jesus angry. And really, understandably so. I mean, how could anyone with any moral sensibilities whatsoever view the temple now with all of its corruption and not be angry? And Jesus, of course, had much more than just mere moral sensibilities. Right? I mean, Jesus had a vested interest in the temple far more than anyone could ever imagine. And so with righteous indignation, Jesus, we're told, he flips over the tables and he chases the merchants out. And as he does so, he's quoting from from two Old Testament passages. The first one's from Isaiah 56, verse 7. This is what we read there. God says, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And the second reference is from Jeremiah 7 verse 11. It says, has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? But I've been watching declares the Lord. You see, the trouble really was, was twofold. I mean, first of all, the temple was, was no longer a place of worship for all people. I mean, it was now basically just for the Jews, right? They turned the, the outer court into this circus, this zoo, this, this oriental bazaar. And then second, the temple was being used as a place for swindlers to make money. You know, it's not the case that just the fact there was money on the premises was the problem. That wasn't the problem. The problem was that people were being swindled. So one commentator said this. He said, that place that should have been a holy, open, and inviting place had been turned into a secular, exclusive, and convenient shop for fleecing the gullible and cashing in on deep religious feelings. And no wonder Jesus was angry. I mean, his father's house. I mean, this place that should have been open and inviting, it was now effectively closed, and it was obviously and certainly costly. What about the cursing of the fig tree? How does that fit in with all this? How does that fit in with the the cleansing of the temple? Well, Mark tells us it took place while Jesus and his disciples were making their way to Jerusalem on that Monday morning, the day after, of course, Jesus' dramatic entrance into Jerusalem. And on the way, Mark tells us that a a hungry Jesus spots spots a fig tree in full leaf. And so he goes up to this fig tree and he's expecting to find fruit. That's what you would expect with a fig tree in full leaf, even though uh, we're told kind of by Mark in almost parenthetical fashion that it wasn't really the season for figs. Nevertheless, here's this fig tree in full leaf. Jesus goes up to it expecting it to find it full of fruit and he finds nothing. And so as Mark tells us in verse 14, Jesus said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. Now that just seems like a really strange thing. That just seems like a really odd thing for Jesus to do. And yet when we consider it in the greater context of the cleansing of the temple, it begins to make much more sense. 
I mean, think about it. Jesus knew as he traveled that Monday morning to the temple, he knew exactly what he would find when he got to the temple. This wasn't his first rodeo. He had been to the temple many times. He knew exactly what he'd find there. And so he decides on the way to use this fig tree as kind of an object lesson for his disciples. You see, the fig tree's leaves promised fruit, but there was no fruit. So the tree's appearance was deceptive. And in that, it was a symbol of what the temple had become. You see, the temple, too, looked promising. Right? It promised religious seekers. It didn't matter if they were Jews or Gentiles, whatever they were, it promised that they would find there in the temple a place of worship. It promised that they would find a place where they could come into the presence of the one true God. But instead, all they found was chaos. I just picture like coals on the day after Christmas. And that's what they found. All they found was chaos. And so Jesus curses this fig tree for being all leaf and no fruit. Just as much as the temple was all show and no substance. You know, that begs the question, what kind of fruit was Jesus looking for? Right, if he's using this fig tree as an object lesson, what kind of fruit was he looking for? And you know, really, that's where verses 20 through 25 help us out. And maybe you caught it as we began to read those verses. Say, wait a minute, this is the next day. And you're right, this is actually on Tuesday. This takes place on Tuesday. But the events are intimately connected with Monday's events, right? So once again, we're told Jesus and the 12, they're going to Jerusalem. They pass by this fig tree that they did the morning before on Monday morning, the one that Jesus had cursed, and now they see that it's all withered. And so Peter points it out, says, Master, look, the tree you cursed is is withered. And Jesus responds, and what does he say? Have faith in God. That's the first fruit that Jesus is looking for. He's looking for faith. He's looking for a real faith. He's looking for a deep faith. He's looking for this wholehearted trust and commitment and dedication to him as the Savior whom God has sent. He says, if you have that kind of faith, you can even move a mountain. He's looking for faith. But then the other fruit he's looking for is forgiveness. Right, as Jesus goes on to say, whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who's in heaven will also forgive you your sins and your trespasses. Faith and forgiveness. These were the things that Jesus was looking for. These were the things, quite frankly, that were lacking there in the temple in Jerusalem. I mean, it should have been a place to foster faith. It should have been a place to find forgiveness. But it was barren. As barren as that now withered fig tree outside of Jerusalem. You see, Monday was the day that Jesus exposed barren lives. Lives that were all leaf and no fruit. Lives that were all show and no substance. Lives that were completely void of faith and forgiveness but lives nonetheless that in just a few days Jesus would give up his own life for on another tree 
just outside of Jerusalem. You know, there's questions that come to mind here. If Jesus were to examine our lives, what would he find? If Jesus were to look into into my life, into your life, what would he find? Would he find what he's looking for? Would he find faith and forgiveness? Or would he find lives that were all leaf and no fruit? Lives that were all show and no substance? Those are hard questions to ask. Those are challenging questions. Those are searching questions. They're questions that, that in which we want to peel back the layers of our heart and look into our true self. Not the persona we project to everyone else, but who we really are. And see, these are questions which will ultimately lead us to the cross and to the crucified Savior. Because it's only there that we'll find the answer we seek. It is only there that we will find that which will satisfy our deepest longing and our most desperate need. May each one of us, especially in the season of Lent, but in every season, may we find our way to the cross. And ultimately, by God's grace, to the empty tomb. Because that is the only place we will find life. And that's the only way that we can have a life that is full of the fruit that Jesus is looking for. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we've taken the opportunity this morning to read and to think about these couple of episodes in Jesus' life that, at least on the surface of things, really make us wonder, what in the world is going on here? And yet when we begin to dig in, we start to see what this is all about. That really, it's a story for each one of us. It's an invitation for each one of us to to really look into our heart of hearts. And finally, it's an invitation for us to make our way to the cross. And ultimately, by your grace, to the empty tomb. Because apart from you, our lives cannot bear the fruit that you want. That faith that is so deep and so secure. That forgiveness that pulses through our being. So Lord Jesus, help us. Help us to find our way to the cross, to the empty tomb to the salvation that you have for each one. Guide us by your Spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to respond and sing together. Oh, Jesus, we adore you. Let's stand as we sing.
receive God's parting blessing. May the love of God the Father and the grace of Jesus Christ the Son, the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Yeah.